So we do everything from the weather service to the ocean service. If you were to, when you guys went out to Depot Bay, did you go out to Depot Bay? You were probably, the captain was probably using a chart. It was produced by NOAA. And I, we also have a fishery service. So NOAA deals with all the marine fisheries and marine mammals. Whereas the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service deals with freshwater fisheries. So I work for something called the Northwest Fishery Science Center. This is one of six regional science centers across the country. There's a Northwest, which is home, uh, homeported in Seattle. There's also a Northeast, a Southeast, a North, uh, Southwest, Alaska, and Hawaii Island, the Pacific Islands. So it's a big organization. Okay. So the title of your worksheet right here, besides having your name, date, and period, um, you can just title it the title of our presentation. So what's going on in the North Pacific? So the mark. point of this talk is that the ocean is not static. Just like the weather changes, the ocean changes. And when the ocean changes, it affects the fish that live in. And that, we've had some really massive changes in the last couple of years because of something called the warm blog, and now the El Nino, possibly the La Nina that might be happening. And that's what this talk is really all about. So what I thought to get uh, started is that we talk a little bit about some questions. Do you want to just do that and start thinking about here? OK. So one of the big questions, and I kind of just gave it away, is does the ocean change like the weather changes? Yes. No. Who thinks it changes like the weather changes? OK. How might you tell that it's changing? go out and look at it, you stand on the bridge in Nemo Bay, and you look at it in the ocean, and you tell it's changed. Well, I mean, it doesn't change uh, like the weather, but it does change. Okay. It's not as visible. Yeah. It actually does change in ways like the weather in small scales. You look out, and it's really rough. We've got white caps. Today, it's really flat. That affects the upper ocean. What's another way it might change? High tide. High tide. That's right. Okay. So we've established the ocean does change like the weather. It actually can change really fast. One of the reasons it doesn't generally change really fast is that it has a lot of inertia. Okay, how many of you have been in a bathtub, sitting in a bathtub, and the water was too cold? Okay, and how much water would you need to add hot, boiling water to your bathtub to get it warm enough? Is it a teaspoon of water to a bathtub to get it warm enough? Probably not, okay? Water has a huge amount of thermal inertia. It also has physical inertia. It, our oceans are moving all the time, but trying to get them to speed up or slow down takes a huge amount of energy. And, and the globe provides a lot of that energy, but it's just, it's kind of a slow system. Next one, okay. Just to clarify, guys, we're not writing these down because we'll be discussing them. Talk to you about I will let you know when we're going to be writing questions down. Okay. okay. So what causes our weather to change here? What are some things that cause the weather to change? It's sunny outside today, right? What is going on out there? Is the sun contributing? 70 degrees, it's hot in this room, right? If it wasn't sunny out, would it be so hot in this room right now? Probably not. Thermal heating, right? The sun has a huge effect on our weather. If you were to be here at midnight, would it be as warm right now as it was outside? No, okay. What's another thing we get here on the coast especially? Why does everybody have flags and why do we have kite festivals? Wind. wind, okay? The wind plays a huge part of the weather here. Another thing is atmospheric pressure, okay? If it's sunny out, does anybody know? Are we having high pressure or are we having low pressure? Whatever. Which did you say? High pressure. That's right. When we have these high pressure cells, we tend to have good weather. When it's low pressure, we have bad weather. We got sun, wind, and atmospheric pressure. Atmospheric pressure, kind of the three. And another one that's really important. If you were to go over east of the Cascades, would the weather be different here than there? Yeah, okay, so why, are, why is it so different? What's in the way? What do you drive over between here? Mountains. So topography, right? The land affects our weather as well. It's really different east of the mountains. Even in the Willamette Valley today, it's, it's 85 degrees in Corvallis right now. It's not 85 here. The topography plays a huge role. Okay. And what we call topography of the ocean is the Okay, so what causes the ocean to change? What did we just talk about for the topography? Whether topography or what we call the symmetry of the ocean, that's one of them. What's another thing we have? 
inhabit this, this reason we have kites here. Wind, right? Okay, the wind is a huge factor in our local climate. This is an upwelling zone. When it blows like stink out of the north every day during the summer, it's pushing the water offshore and it sucks full nutrient rich water up. So if it's windy, this process is working, we're getting this replenishment of nutrients. If it's not windy, it doesn't happen. And in the winter, you get southerlies, right? It looks like stink out of the south, these big storms. That's actually pushing the water to get down the it pushes water onto the coast. It can't go anywhere. It runs into the shore and it goes down. Okay? So wind is a huge factor. What's another thing that might cause the ocean to change? It affects it. We have currents in the ocean. Yes. Okay. What are currents caused by? Currents are actually caused by the Earth spinning. Okay. And does this Earth spin at the exact same rate every single day? No. No. It doesn't. So it's kind of the ballerina effect. You can actually look up and have tables of what rate the Earth is spinning. It, it varies by microseconds per year. But it does change in that sense. Just you. Bella, Bella, who are you talking about? It is. There's a huge amount of, of thermal heating in the ocean as well. It does warm up. And especially our rivers, our creeks. Do you go swimming in the winter? No. Why do you? <laughs> Some creeks. Yeah. But the, what, the sunlight, that energy is a huge part. No, certainly small bodies of water, and then the top of the ocean. Okay, so we've got some things about how the ocean changes. Okay, so do fish and invertebrates respond to this? How many of you went fishing for uh, cocoa salmon last year? Did you catch any last year? Yeah. Okay, the year before? Not as much. Okay, so the catch, how about crabbing? Some years you go out there, there's lots of crabs, other years it's too much of it. Not sure you think it. Okay. So, what do you think the answer to this question is? Yes. Are they responding to it? Okay. They do. Just like it means their environment. And that's really a lot of what this talk is about, is that the ocean is very important. Things are responding to it, and we've seen some pretty extreme conditions. Okay. So, on the same thing, the global global processes, who knows what the element is? So the globe, El Nino is a global process that's occurring, it was occurring down at the equator. This is, we're having the largest El Nino event in last century. It affects our climate worldwide. And I'll show you some figures of what's going on. The answer to this is yes. So we may think, oh, we're only affected by our little area. But what goes on in other parts of the world affects us. And then finally, kind of getting back to this large scale processes. How many snow days do you guys have? That. Did you have any last year? Yes. Not last year. The year before you hit a lot. Last year we probably didn't have any. And it's because of this warm water that it affects you directly in the number of snow days. And my prediction, and you'll like this, is that next year, if we get a La Nina, you guys are going to have some snow days. So it affects you directly. Okay. So this is what we're going to be talking about today, which is what is the warm blob, yeah, what are El Nino's and La Nina's, and then how have ocean conditions responded, but I'll talk a little bit about freshwater as well as we to those things. Anomalies are a statistical term, and 
they're the values with either the seasonal trend or some kind of annual trend we move. So if, say, this is temperature, this is the time over a year, this is the temperature goes up in the summer, down in the winter, get next. Okay. Then you go out there and you measure it, and this is the values you came up with. Then the difference between this point on this line and that point on that line is the anomaly. In this way, in case it's negative, it means it's colder than it should be. And in this case here, at this point, we have a positive anomaly. So it's warmer than it should be. And basically, what happened, the reason we do this is what if I said the temperature was freezing tomorrow? But you go, you go, whoa, it should be freezing tomorrow outside, right? But if we, I was here in January and I said it was going to freeze tomorrow, you're like, whatever, it's normal, right? So we're trying to get that seasonal cycle out there and just look how unusual it is it and put it in context, essentially, okay? Okay, so what is the warm walk? How many of you guys, you probably, none of you even noticed the video. Okay, good. I did that talk to a bunch of old people, gray hairs, and they're all like, oh, we love that movie. Okay, next one. So the blob. So the blob started back in 2013 and 14. This is North America. Here we are, we're about there, right? Baja, Mexico, Alaska, Siberia, Kamchatka Peninsula. This is the North Pacific Ocean. This is an atmospheric pressure anomaly. So this is pressure different from what it should be at that time of year. The colors are on the scale. This is a really high pressure system. We talked earlier, when it's sunny out, you don't have storms, it's high pressure. So this big blob, what they call it a ridiculously resilient ridge, sat out over the North Pacific in the winter. This is for uh, November 1st through the beginning of January. It sat out there and it blocked all the storms that we had to get. If you remember, this is the fall before last, and we didn't get any storms. It was really amazing. It just, it, it didn't rain like it normally does because of this big storm, or this big high pressure thing where these storms would normally come through our area. And that did two things. One is that those storms transfer a lot of heat from the surface down to depth. So the ocean is stratified. Deeper water tends to be colder than the surface. And in the winter, those big storms mix it. You don't want to be out there uh, in the winter. It blows like stink, huge, huge waves, and it's mixing that water. And it transfers a lot of heat from the surface down to depth. So that didn't happen because of this ridge. Another thing that happens is that you get wind off of the, when those storms come off Siberia, it's really, really cold and they come over the ocean, which is relatively warm, and a lot of that heat gets transferred from the water up into the atmosphere, okay? And that didn't happen either. So what we have then next is the warm block, okay? So what this is, is this is just ocean water that's warmer than it should be. This is a sea surface, sea surface temperature anomaly. And you can see this is two to three degrees centigrade above average. So getting back to this idea, is this bigger or little? This is enormous. Think of the area of this. I mean, this is bigger than Washington and Oregon combined, side to side, and it's three degrees above what it should be. That's a huge amount of energy that did not get dissipated from that system. So this is the warm pot right there. It's just this massive amount of water. Okay, and it's sitting out in the middle of the Gulf of Alaska. It wasn't along our coast. It's perfectly normal. This is spring of 2014. Next. So just to clarify, warm blob, massive amount of what? Warm water caused by what? Unusually high pressure. The warm blob itself just means a lot of warm water in this one area. The cause of it is unusually high pressure over this specific area. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this is spring. Now this is June of 2014, so summer before last. Here's the warm blob out there, right? This is a, also a sea surface temperature anomaly. The scale's a little bit different, but you can see kind of two to three degrees warmer than average out there. Along our coast, though, it was perfectly normal. It didn't come on shore. And so if you were a little baby salmon going out to the ocean, you came out of, say, the Columbia or out of Equina or any of our rivers, you entered what appeared to be a fairly normal ocean. Okay, next. But in September, it came on shore here. So this is Stonewall Bank. This is 17 miles offshore of Newport. This is a buoy that sits out there. And you can go on your computer and you can look at the water temperature on Stone at Stonewall Bank. 
instantaneously. So there's about an hour lag. They also have wind meters and air temperature and all kinds of stuff. And this is the record. And you can see here on September 13th, the temperature was about 12 degrees. And over a 21 uh, hour period, it went all the way up to 18 degrees as the warm log moved on to This is unprecedented. People have been saying this a long time. I've never seen anything like this. That massive warm water moving on shore. So the next one? So up six degrees in a 24 hour period. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Huge, huge, huge. Okay. So then here we are in November. And you can see it's not as intense as it was out in the middle, but now it's warm all the way along the coast. Okay. So our ocean is on the order of one to two degrees warmer than it should be. Next one. Okay. Here's February. So this is last spring. It's still warm. So all the little sand that went up went into a warm ocean. This is June of, of uh, last year. You can still see the warm block. And then now we're starting to get the El Nino at the equator. El Ninos are typified by warm water at the equator. Here you can see it. Okay, so next one. So this is last week. Okay, this is a different scale. But here we are, here's Oregon. Here's the temperature anomalies. We're still looking at between one to two degrees above average. Off our coast. Here's the El Nino starting to break down. Blues are colder than average, starting to get a little bit of a La Nina signal. But basically, we still have this mass of warm water all over the coast from the block. Okay. Next. Okay. So when you have really warm water offshore, it affects what goes on onshore as well, right? Whenever we get wind off the ocean, it cools the temperature. It's what keeps us cool here in the summer. But it works at larger scales too. So these are temperature anomalies for land temperatures for an average over Washington, Oregon, and Idaho over the last three years. And what I've done is I've color coded them. So these red bars, these are monthly anomalies. These are the highest on record. This is a 121 year record. And these were the highest. So we had a really, really warm ocean in 2014, right offshore. And what do you know? We got a really, really warm okay, because of that. So this warm water offshore, it's like having a heating blanket this offshore. It kept us really, really warm. And the next one, this is air temperature. Air temperature. Okay. And then the next one is precipitation. So this is rain. So you can see that we had dry winters. This is the winter period. This is precipitation. So this is how different it is from normal. And during the winter of 13-14 and then 14-15, it was really, really dry. And if you put warm temperature and relatively dry together, what happens to your snow? You don't get any, right? You guys didn't get any snow days this year. Okay, next one. So this is the snow, last year's snowpack, in March 2015, so last March. Okay, there was almost no snow in the mountains. They were really, really concerned about most people's water supplies. In fact, they were talking about sending water from the coast into the Willamette Valley because they were running out. Alci, or uh, Yahats, had a water ration program. We didn't hear, but this is a big deal around here. Okay, so hardly any snow, and the closer you got to the coast, the less snow there was. So, next one, compare that to this year. This is March of this year, when these greens are average, okay, versus the reds over there are, are below 50%. So this is this is much more normal, although this is not going away. Next. Okay. So when you have hardly any snowpack around here, we end up with really warm rivers. Because the snow is a huge source of water for our rivers and it's really, really cold when it melts. So this is from June of 2015, and all the red dots are below average stream flow in a bunch of stream days all over the northwest. Okay. So what happens then is that you end up with warm water in the rivers. So this is the Columbia at two different places. The red line here is 2015. The black line is the average, the long-term average. And these vertical lines are 20 degrees Celsius. Salmon are cold water fish, and it's once the water gets over 20 degrees Celsius, they start having problems. They get really sick, and they will die. It's much higher. So you can see that a lot more days, normally it gets a little bit over 20, but in 2015, especially the Willamette, they, were, they had almost 90 days, or over 90 days, but it was over 20 degrees Celsius. So what happened next? Is it above 20 degrees, what happens to salmon? They die. They die. They die. Yeah. They get sick and die. 
Okay, so next, so this is when the little salmon, the smolts, were going downstream. And you can see in most places it was one or two degrees above average, which is not great for them. But what really got nailed is the sunrise that came in right at the right time. They came in right when we had the, the highest uh, temperature in almost the creeks. So they were the warmest. Uh, they estimate that about 95% of the sockeye salmon that crossed Bonneville Dam did not make it to where they were It was just wiped it out. It was a huge, huge return. Over half a million fish returned that were counted going over Bonneville and then they all died. And so this is a sockeye. I don't know if you can see it. These are sores that are bacterial infections that are starting to infect this fish. It's a lot of the sturgeon up in the uh, reservoirs up above Bonneville also died. Big, huge fish, really long lived. They, they could not take those temperatures. So it affects this temperature. It's an ocean phenomenon, but it's affecting us on land too. So. Okay, next. Okay, so El Ninos. El Ninos are tropical phenomena. Nobody knows why they start, but a classic El Nino signature is this, where you have this really, really warm water on the equator. Okay? And it screws up temperature patterns around the world, and I'll show you that in a little bit. The, when we have El Ninos, it tends to be warm along our coast. A lot of this water on the equator gets actually transported up into our neck of the woods, and it's warmer than average here. Okay, La Ninas are kind of the opposite of that. La Ninas happen when the water at the equator is really cold, and we tend to get cold water that comes up our coast. When those happen, okay? So next. are diminishing, so it's cooling off at the equator, and a La Nina is favored to develop during summer of 2016, with about a 75% chance of a La Nina during the fall of the of Okay, So they think it might flip from a really warm at the equator to a really cold at the equator, with about a 75% chance. That's So how they measure El Ninos is in this area, and I realize this is very good. This is South America here. Here you can see Mexico. This is Australia, Papua New Guinea. So this is the equator of the Pacific. What they do is they measure the sea surface temperature anomalies in this little box. This is called the El Nino 3-4 box. Okay, so next. So this is what those anomalies look like. So this is the big red ones are when it was really warm in that box, and then Blue ones are when it was really cold in that box. And these are actually, these are La Niñas, these are El Niños, okay? So next slide, and we've had three really big El Niños in the last century. We had one in 82, 83, and you can see this is a higher peak than anything before it. We also had the 97, 98 El Nino, and then we have this 2015, 16. Okay, this is on par with these other two as far as massive events, okay? Next, and this is, if you blow this thing up, oops, go back. This is what it looks like. So this is the actual sea surface temperature anomaly in this box over time. So this is July of last summer, all the way through basically right now. You can see it peaked in November, and it's cooling off. And so the equator right now in this area is cooling off, and it's more or less back to zero. So the, it's, it's where it should be, okay? So one of the things that's really different about this El Nino than the previous El Ninos is that the North Pacific was already warm. Okay, so this is the 97-98 event. This is June of 1997. This is the sea surface temperature anomaly. You can see this warm water at the equator, which is typical El Nino, and a little bit of warming up here, but not much. This is the exact same thing that this year, or I should say last year. This is June of 2015, last summer. 
You can see the El Nino, strong El Nino, but the whole North Pacific is already warm. Okay. Why is it warm? That's right. And the, which caused the, what are those two words? There you go. Warm blob. Warm blob. So yeah, warm blob plus El Nino equals very warm. So what happens when you have El Ninos? I told you it causes global effects. This is what happens in the uh, North America, okay? You get warmer than average temperatures across northern US, and it tends to be wetter and cooler in California, okay? You've probably heard a lot about this in the news. California is actually getting rained on, or was last winter. And it's been really, really warm this winter for us here, okay? We've had really warm weather. So that's a classic pattern. And then the next one is what happens in the La Ninas. Okay, this is what happens when we have La Ninas, which is what might happen next winter, where it's cold and wetter in our area. What happens when it's cold and wet in our area? We get snow. Okay, you guys like it? Might get a snow day, and certainly we'll get a lot of snowpack. And then it's going to be drier across the southern US. Okay, so this is something that's occurring way down here at the equator. And it's off the chart and it's affecting our area and it affects the entire globe. So they have uh, drought in Brazil, they've got drought in uh, they've had heat, heat waves in India, those are all related to this El Nino Monday. It affects weather. Okay, next. Okay, so I've been talking about this really, really warm ocean that we've been having across the North Pacific in our particular region. So what are some of the effects, the biology? Did the fish respond to it? Moved. Yeah. So this, anybody recognize this fish? This is ocean sunfish. Okay. This is my friend Joe Worsley. He lives in Juneau, Alaska. He caught this in June. Okay. Up until 2014, when the blob started, he has never seen this. He's been out there for 25 years. He does surveys and he's big nets out in the ocean. He's never seen one of these things. Now he gets them all the time. Why? They move because. It's warm, exactly. They think they're down in California. Where are they? They're up in Alaska. Okay. So this is pretty typical of what's going on. Okay. Another big impact from warm water is the largest pseudo-nutrient diet on remove on record. You guys probably know this because through the next one, close down the razor clam fisheries and it closed down the crab fisheries. Okay. This is a diatom. This is a single-celled animal that tends to get colonial. It's a phytoplankton, so this is the, the trees of the sea, and it produces a neurotoxin that if you, as a human, eat it, it will kill you, okay, if you get enough of it. And if you have smaller levels that are sublethal, as in they won't kill you, it will permanently remove your ability to form short-term memory. So you have a crab or a razor clam for dinner, and you have Alzheimer's, and it will never go away. You have changed your brain from this neurotoxin. The guys I know who work on this stuff do not eat crab, they do not eat razor crabs anymore. Even okay. when it's allowed. Even when it's allowed. It's cumulative, okay? This is really, really nasty stuff. If you cook your crab, you cook your razor clams, it's still there. It doesn't, doesn't degrade, okay? So we've had it closed our razor clam fishery last spring, and it kept our crab fishery, the commercial crab fishery, from opening this fall. And in fact, it wasn't until uh, in the middle of January down in California that they completely opened their crab fisheries because this neurotoxin is out there. Another thing it does is that it kills many mammals. Okay? We don't think it really affects fish. They have a fairly simple uh, neuro nervous system, but many mammals it gets it. So the next one... And why are we seeing more of this? Um, more water. water. More water. Yeah. Sorry, maybe what you're Okay. So this is some work that one of my colleagues did, a woman I work with, and these are, these were primarily dead whales and sea lions and birds, and this shows whether they had high in red or low in orange sea, uh, levels of demolic acid in them. They look in the stomachs, they look in the gut contents, they actually look at the brain if the animal's in good enough shape. These ones with circles around them were alive and they were having seizures which is really typical of the boic acid poisoning. So you can see that from California, Southern California, all the way up, there are marine mammals that were, they, what they do is they eat 
forage fish, things like sardines and anchovy that are eating the pseudonychia, the diatom, and then they get it. And the Marine Mammal Center in Sausalito reported over 200 sea lions last summer with the lower acid poisoning that they got. They, these guys, they don't know where they are, they don't know what they're doing there. And what do we call that when it goes up in the food chain?
and they were also really skinny. So this is a normal salmon, these are skinny salmon, and we don't think these guys can survive. They, they can't, they, they haven't been eating, uh, that's a bad deal. Okay, adults on the other hand were kind of mixed. So on the Oregon coast, returns in 2015, last year, last fall, were horrible. They got about a third of what they were expecting. It's the lowest they've been since the 1990s, with Oregon Coast Cobra that put on the endangered species. But at the same time, the Chinook were about that range. So it kind of depends on what species, and also when they went to the ocean. Chinook go to the ocean a year, the Chinook that returned in 2015 went to the ocean a year before the Cobra. So the Cobra spent one year in the ocean. Chinook spent two or more years. It's a difference. In the Columbia, we also saw big returns of Chinook and Sockeye in 2015. Again, they went out in 2013, but it was pretty good. The Sockeye got nailed by that hot water dam count when they came into the river. And the Chinook, so jacks, I'll skip the jacks, but we expect that the fish that entered in the ocean in 2014 and 15 are going to do really bad because it was really, really warm and there wasn't any. So these are returns of coho last year and this coming year. We don't expect there to be many coho coming back. And then this coming year and next year, for sure, because they spent longer on the ocean. Okay, what are some other things we saw? These are kind of the weirdies. So last summer, somebody caught a school of swordfish off the coast, one of the hate books. 35 miles off Pico Bay. There was, the biggest one was 450 pounds. And they were looking at their regs, trying to kind of figure out, what do we do with these fish? And there's nothing about catching swordfish because it's never happened before, okay? We, usually we see in the warm years, like the 97, 98 El Nino, one or two swordfish got caught, but this was a whole school. What got to do with that? Uh, I'm not sure, I think. I don't know, either they went to the galley or they got left back over there. Yeah, those are kind of your choices, because they're probably dead. Okay, I mentioned we had mola molas up in Alaska. They also had thresher sharks, which normally don't go up there. Uh, skipjack tuna were also up in Alaska. Uh, our albacore tuna were going all the way up into Canada, in Vancouver Island, they were catching uh, albacore tuna. There's been a huge seabird die off last winter in Alaska. These seabirds eat forage fish. And we don't know if it's because the forage fish weren't there and aren't there at all, or they, they were somewhere else than they normally, normally are. These are, we're talking hundreds of thousands of common birds that die. Uh, this is an opar, this is a tropical fish. This was caught off the Bay also, seven miles offshore in one of the party boats. Uh, these are truly tropical. We had a lot of weird pelagic species that were here on the Oregon coast, in fact, washing up on the beaches. Uh, humpback whales came into the Columbia River estuary for the first time that anybody knows of. We think again, because it's this narrow, narrow band of warm water, or cold water along the coast, they were following the anchovies and they ended up in the in the estuary without realizing because normally the anchovies are spread in the offshore the last year. And then we've had tons and tons of sea lions. Okay, it turns out California, which is where these sea lions are supposed to be, was horrible last year. So they had all these pops on it because the moms couldn't find anything to eat. And if you were an adult sea lion, you would come up here instead of hanging out in California where you'd starve to death, right? Okay, so events in other areas affect us as well in this case. And last year was the first time anybody's seen Okay, so I talked about the La Nina. The forecast right now is a 75% chance that we're going to have the La Nina, and these are going to bring you those snow days. So if we do get the La Nina, if the predictions are correct, then the ocean should cool off. It will be great for crab, salmon, other cool water species, sable fish, rockfish. Uh, there's a lot of things that like cool water. Uh, we can expect a cold and wet winter starting next fall. And here are the snow days. If you get snow days, remember me. Lori told us we're going to get snow days. Good skiing in the Cascades. Uh, this is the big question. How long is it going to last? Okay, if it gets cool, how long is it going to take until it comes back up? So the prediction, the long-term prediction with climate change is that we should expect more frequent and more intense El Nino's for long days. So how long this lasts is a huge problem. Okay. Are they changing the uh, limits on salmon catch for the future right now, considering what they think will happen? So a lot of the, the they have greatly reduced uh, the catches for this year. We got, we got four minutes. We're not leaving yet, okay? Let's stay here. We're going to wrap up here. We're going to go and build a belt, okay?
the great question based on what they've invented. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Other questions? That's the end of my talk.